if you want to learn more about camera trap photography and especially photographing mountain lions, this is the place. Johanna has developed expertise in both areas and will share her expertise and her wonderful mountain lion photos in today's episode. Welcome, Johanna, to season six of the Photographing the West podcast. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. So what got you started in camera trap photography? I um I started I've been a lifelong hiker and lover of wildlife. My whole family grew up watching, uh, you know, honestly, um, PBS and nature specials. And when I moved to California, I took actually a ranger led program in Anza Borrego State Park, where we followed a mountain lion biologist. It's sort of a day in the life. And one of the stops that we did was to check his camera trap. And at the time it was a little homemade um, handheld digital point and shoot camera that was rigged up to all kinds of wires and everything. And I had never heard of it before, didn't know anything about it. And we sat down and we started looking through these photos that had been captured two or three nights before we were there. And he had a bobcat visiting a, a roadkill deer that he had set out. And um, the bobcat visited, a skunk visited, some more deer went by and it, it just to sit, there was something about sitting in the spot where all that had just happened and getting to see it that despite all the other exciting parts of that day, that stuck with me. And um, I asked him, well, how, you know, how do you do this? Is this some top secret technology? And he said, well, you can buy them at Cabela's. <laughs> you know? um, so I bought one that night. And then um, as, as fun hobbies do, it spiraled out of control. <laughs> yeah, they have a habit of doing that, don't they? Yeah. So um, you're a self-taught camera trap photographer, which I guess is what you prefer to call yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, talk about that journey from, uh, from Ansel Borrego Ford. <laughs> to today. So it's been kind of a mix between the two parts of camera trapping to me, which are the animal tracking and observation part, and then the photography and more artistic part. And at different times, one of those will be more fun or more my, my main goal than the other. So since that first day, there was a long, long period, maybe a year, year and a half, where I had my one old Moultrie trail cam that used six D cell batteries and had a 10 second long or five second uh, trigger time, which <laughs> was pretty useless. And putting that sort of randomly in the woods and in our local mountains and not knowing what I was doing at all. And, you know, I would get the tail end of a squirrel and it was super exciting. <laughs> uh, and, trail cameras became a little less expensive. So I added a few more and I really started to focus on tracking and, and trying to find good locations instead of just tossing them out there and got good at identifying mountain lion tracks. And that, you know, that was the goal. That's our big uh, charismatic predator here. And they're in the news here, of course, because we have, uh, threatened population because we're so, we're getting so or so much urban development and isolating them so seeing a mountain lion was the ultimate goal and then you know you you learn about identifying tracks and you start to be good at seeing tracks and scrapes and learning some patterns, how often they seem to come through. And then you get the first 
photo and it all comes together like i i accomplished this i got to see this animal that nobody ever sees there's just sort of rumored to be out there you know then it became okay well i have this grainy black and white five second video of the back half of a mountain lion walking by and how can i how can i do better and camera technology improved and that helped um and then i started seeing people taking a dslr and converting that into a camera trap and getting these like professionally lit beautiful things and um again sort of like ultimate goal um could i possibly get an image that beautiful and um i then i had to learn about sensors and wiring and batteries and um didn't really want to have never been an electrical minded macgyvery person um but i wanted the end result so bad that i i just it's like this is what i'm going to do i'm going to figure it out and um yeah now i'm fortunate enough to have some local exhibits and be able to sell the photos to raise money for land conservation and and it's still as fun as ever so it's turned into some good stuff so did you do all this on your own or did you have a mentor or uh, training somewhere along the line how did all that work out um a few, a few friends a good friends along the way each with their own talents um dan potter is a good friend who worked on figuring out how to write code for sensors so that we could um a you know arcane there yeah <laughs> right yeah <laughs> there's not uh he was um before he retired he was an engineer for aerospace uh -huh. so he he had that in and i would say like i well i need i don't need it to go off five times in a second i need them spaced out a little more and can you do more of a delay and can we have you know more sensitivity head on instead of side to side and um fun for him to learn those things as as we went along and then fun for me to be able to make use of it and um uh martin lenoble a just amazing tracker who if you hike with him it's a lot of take two steps and then you know wait for martin to analyze the millimeter measurements of a mouse track <laughs> and figure out where that was going and he loves that and uh roy dunn again from the photography standpoint he was a professional photographer and then brought all of the lighting angles and lens selection and um professional photography aspect to it so yeah it did it brings in so many talents from so many different angles yeah Sounds like you had some uh, pretty nice friends there. Yeah. So what uh, captured your imagination about mountain lions? I'm from uh, upstate New York. That's where I grew up. And we didn't have animals bigger than groundhogs. <laughs> really, um, everything had been wiped out. Um, and yeah when i moved to california it was just a it it was as if i went to africa or something just the idea of having bobcats and mountain lions and and sort of these animals just out there um i haven't been fortunate enough to travel much in the west um so i've never been to yellowstone I really haven't been much in the rockies so this just this idea of a 130 pound cat running around 
in one of the biggest cities in the world it was just fascinating well yeah that's something you would think about uh when you think about la i guess huh yes yeah and everything that i read about them were these just these rumored things someone would post on a hiking forum that they saw one and there but there was no picture and then people would say, no you probably only saw a bobcat or <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was like is this real are these yeah. are they really there um and yeah everyone was afraid of this thing that no one ever saw yeah yeah, well, they're apex predators, uh, so uh, that's uh, not a position that uh, humans like to be in. Uh, we consider ourselves the apex predator, I think, most of the time. Right. Yeah, and and um, if you're living in a big city, that's not something you ever thought you'd have to consider in your life <laughs> is, yeah, will, right. my, will my dog be eaten by a mountain lion you think well i'm in you know malibu why <laughs> why would that happen right so what kind of gear are you using these days you started out uh with the the commercial ones i guess and then uh, i think you're into the dslrs now or uh, mirrorless or or what uh, a little bit of everything i've got a good big fleet of cheap trail cams that are great for just scouting and sort of disposable if they get stolen or broken or whatever um then i have about 10 dslrs using canon i'm, I'm just familiar with canon so it works for me um, but yeah, about 10 of those. And then in the last two, about two years, I've started doing the Sony mirrorless video setups. And again, about seven to 10 of those. Uh, currently, wow. yeah, currently three of them are stuck in Montana, which is <laughs> kind of a bummer. <laughs> it's starting to get very cold. Yeah. In, and I would like I would like to get them back, but in the spring maybe, huh? Oh gosh, I hope not. I could use them here. So, um, how do you protect all your gear so it doesn't get stolen or broken or whatever? Most of it is now on private property. That's yeah. that's been the best solution, and it's um. It's an interesting dynamic that we have sort of celebrities or wealthy people in LA that own beautiful property and lots of it. And they think it's pretty cool to be able to see big wildlife on their property. So it works for me, it works for them. Um, and if I'm on public land, they're very remote so the the ones that i you know i really want to have in the san gabriel mountains or even the santa monica mountains are are several miles up a trailless canyon where you know no one in their right mind goes so except for me so you, uh, uh, I'm assuming you use a cable or something to attach them to trees or some other immobile object? Yeah, Python locks. Um, if I really need to secure it, it's usually a couple of lag bolts right through the case into a tree trunk yeah. and a Python or two around the whole thing through the handle and a padlock or two. And it's just make it as as difficult and time consuming as possible. Um, the other thing I've done lately is if I'm on a sandy um, canyon wash, I'll dig a hole, add some mortar mix, and basically make a big concrete anchor with a, a metal post in it, a signpost. So it's like, hey, if you want to carry this 
40 pound block of of concrete up the trail then good for you man <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah i guess that would work yeah so you're uh making your own setups yeah mostly the video setups are um cognizus but the dslrs i'm i'm sticking with my homemade um I'm using Ralph Davis Game Watcher sensors. Okay. And of course, Dan Potter's code and um, lots of Pelican cases and uh, plumbing parts and miscellaneous hardware. So, for those who aren't familiar with camera trapping, uh, explain all the hardware that goes into these setups. Yeah, so you need a um, a sturdy weatherproof case because it's going to get weather and uh, animals sniffing and you know leaning on it and bears trying to investigate it. And you need something to mount it to. Once you have your your camera in its nice little case with the hole for the lens. Usually, hopefully, that's a big sturdy tree, but if not, um, you need a, some kind of metal stake or post or tripod. And then with the DSLRs, I have at least two flashes off to the sides. So then you need tree branches or poles for those. And batteries extra batteries. Um, in my case, I'm actually making battery packs out of 18650 lithiums because they're rechargeable and lightweight. But again, that's um, home engineering lithium batteries is not, uh, not recommended to try at home <laughs> <laughs> unless you're looking for a quick fire. But um, I'm doing it anyway. Good luck. <laughs> Sounds like you've uh, gotten uh, quite a bit of expertise at uh, this whole process as far as putting putting things together and organizing them and everything. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like right now I'm at a good stage where I have a handle on things and I have a good idea of how long the whole setup is going to last and how it's going to react. But um, I'll kind of plateau like that and then either run into a problem that I haven't had before or have an idea that I don't know yet if it's a good idea or crazy, so I'll just try it. And then, a, then there will be a whole new like, oh, no, I want to change all 10 of my camera traps to be this way now, you know. So... Uh... You've become a MacGyver after all, huh? I think so, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> no one's ever, um, <laughs> if, if we need a battery in this house for anything, I have it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I have okay. every kind of battery known to man. Yeah, okay. So now that you've uh, learned all that stuff, do you teach other people how to do it or, or not? Um, there are, I mean, there are some local people getting into it that will send me a message and say, how do I do this? And I'm happy to, you know, go through the process with them and help them find out what, what's going to work. Um, I don't, I don't do anything, um, formal as far as classes. We're kind of a we're kind of a small demographic, I think, <laughs> mm. although it's growing. Yeah, seems to be. Yeah, I've been looking for classes around here in uh, Carson City and uh, doesn't seem to be much available. So I guess it's uh, kind of a do it yourself, huh? Right. I've, you know what I've always wanted to do? Um, are you you're familiar with um, I'm not going to know his real name, but Camera Trap Codger. No, 
for a, followed him for a long time uh, and gosh i wish chris wilmers and he's in the western sierra somewhere around somewhere in the foothills sacramento or something like that well not far then and, yeah um he had for a few years uh a week-long gathering in uh in the sierra and it it was some camp that he was familiar with the owners and he would rent it out for a week and we would have about 10 people show up and they'd set camera traps out and work on building your own and it sounded like so much fun and I was never able to make it up there and then of course the world fell apart and <laughs> no one could you know. get together but I would love it's something I've always wanted to do is a um just a good week-long camp out get get a bunch of people together and and try things so so if you can promote that idea i'll work on it too okay sounds like a plan well let's uh take a look at your photos here all right uh so this is one of your famous ones i think uh talk about this one this one's been around a lot it um came out exceptionally well for being one of the earliest mountain lion photos I got. And definitely, I would say one of the first cityscapes that I attempted. This is a female lion named Nikita. Uh, nicknamed her because she has a notch in her right ear. So it's a Nick, you know, uh, sure. better than saying the, the female lion that lives here, you know. And um, yes, looking straight, straight south, downtown Los Angeles and the city of Glendale is all below her. And she's headed, she's headed down into, into town. Uh, it's a Canon 6D flash, flash on either side. So you can see the shadow, you can see the shadow from one flash on the right, and then there's another flash on the left, and there's a shadow cast in the other direction. And this was done, this was done with a game watcher, I believe. Uh, I don't know how much detail, how, how techy you want to get the tricky thing about a cityscape shot is that you want the animal in a very specific mostly centered place turn my phone off i would think i would think the exposure would be uh tricky as well yeah the way the exposure is done is you get one shot this isn't a burst because as the animal walks through, she triggers the camera, the flashes go off, and then it's dark and she continues to walk through. The shutter stays open uh, for about, usually with the cityscapes, it's three to five seconds is all it needs. But that shutter stays open until until the camera decides it's had enough. So instead of getting a burst of four or five where you can pick her position, it's just gonna be one and done. So you have to be dead on with your aim and your focus and, and everything. And you have to arrange it so that behind the animal, the scene has to be completely dark. So there's always a there's always a dark background just behind the subject because as she as she travels if there's any light continuing to come into that sensor it's going to shine through the body. Uh, it's a yeah. bit of a yeah it's a bit of a trick to pull it off. Um, yeah. yeah, then would be we call it ghosting where you see 
you see the background through the animal. Right. And um, then the, then the funny thing is the image, yeah, is very popular. It's pretty, it's, it's iconic. It's exposed, right? She's in focus. I then waited another year and a half to two years to try to get her coming in the other direction so we could see her face and it never happened. Um, yeah. She did it, she did that travel, but the camera wouldn't be working or the time of day wouldn't be quite right. And um, I just, I just never got it. So that's a, that's a regret that I have. I would love to have this scene and see her face. Right. Uh, seems strange she didn't uh, turn when uh, the flash went off. She, she might have. Um, but the camera didn't catch it. No? Wouldn't know it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, the other thing is she, by this point, she was very used to getting flashed uh, <laughs> by cameras, so she didn't react anymore. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a lot more technique involved. Uh, I'm learning uh, in setting these up uh, than you would think, uh, just casually thinking about it, I guess. Yeah, it's, well, it's all dependent on the scene. Um, so it, it, yeah, it can change pretty drastically depending on what you're trying to do. And you're typically setting these up during the, oops, sorry, I mean to do that. Um, typically setting them up in the daytime. So you don't really, uh, you kind of have to anticipate what it's going to look like at night, I guess, huh? Yeah. The first, the first one is, is a guess based on other how other setups have worked and then usually let it go a week or two and come back and and whatever has come by even it's even if it's a rat you know at least i can see lighting and then i'll i'll adjust a little bit and then i'm then i'm good so some animal has to has to test it out for me to fine tune it at night yeah Okay. So this is a young mountain lion, I guess, huh? This is the same female. Um, this is Nikita again. Oh. She is small. Um, I would guess from her track measurements and various photos comparing her size to my dog's size that she's under 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. She's little, little, little. Okay. Um, yeah, and this um, this one I had a little more experience. This was done with a Cognosis beam trigger, so that there is a uh, basically a light beam that's a trip wire, of, so that anything going around or above or below that beam won't won't set the camera off. So that really gives you precision that I want the animal right here or I don't want the camera to fire. Um, that makes things a whole lot easier. Um, and, and you want that delay to be fairly short, I understand, uh, in tenth of a second or something like that? Yeah, yeah, for the cannons, it's... Um, there's no built-in like I could set a delay if I wanted to hide that those sensors out of view somehow and I couldn't do it but for most of my setups it's as there's no built-in delay so it's whatever the time delay to wake the camera and fire it which is yeah probably a tenth of a second not much more okay Sometimes, sometimes, like I said, if, if I couldn't hide those two, you know, there's two parts to that beam setup that has to be on either side of her. Right. And this, I just had nice chaparral to hide them down in there. If it's wide open and you can't really hide it, you have to think about, um, you might have to put them further down the trail and then say, give it a second, like wake it up as it's coming this direction, but don't fire until it's here. And that, oh, 
that is so nerve wracking. It hardly ever works. Yeah. That would be a tough calculation, I would think. Yeah. And this actually, this one, um, I had a flash fail. Uh, uh, the right, the right side of her face is in shadow and that should have been lit, but that one, the batteries died or it, it fell over or something. <laughs> so it's, it's not perfect. It's a little moody, which is fine. And it's, it's a cool shot and I like it, but there's always like, it's always something. Yeah. That's what I gather the more I read. Yeah. Her again, a little farther up the same trail. And this one I like because her eyes are dark and clear. The trouble with an animal that's evolved to see in the dark is that they have a super highly reflective backside of their eye. The um, so the part that reflects when you, when someone takes a point and shoot camera where the flash is right on the, on top of the lens and you get red eye right. with a mountain lion is times a thousand <laughs> because uh -huh. back their eye is like, is like a mirror and their pupils are dilated like crazy because they've been walking around in the pitch dark. So right. when, when you get a lot of these, it, it's very, very difficult with a mountain lion or even bobcats, any nocturnal animal to not get a, a whited out or bluish glow to the eye. Um, and even if you Photoshop and darken it and try to get that effect out, it's not, they just want that sparkle in the eye, you want it to be real. And that's all angle. The flashes need to be up high and pointed down and off to the sides. You just cannot flash them head on and it'll, or it'll reflect. So this was sort of the, one of the best photos where that worked very well. I didn't have to touch these eyes at all. So that's what I'm proud of with that. Yeah. Yeah, and the eyes are in really sharp focus also. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a great photo. Now this one, this one was on a burst. And so um, maybe I could send you those if you wanna show the difference where she's not quite in focus and her pose isn't quite right. And then, then you know, this one is two out of four or two out of five and this is the uh, one that worked. Yeah. Yeah, I caught the, uh, the right uh, leg is moving forward. And uh, so there's lots of action in there as well. Yeah. Great shot. Thank you. It's hard not to get these where people say, oh, it looks like taxidermy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Or uh, like a museum display. Right, yeah. And this one, like you just mentioned, the what I love about this is the motion. Um, this was, there was a mother lion with two adolescent kittens. This is the third one that passed by. So mom walked by, kitten number one was, the, the kittens were playing around or something and they, I would guess the second one was already running and this this one was chasing after it's it's litter mate and because i have a i have an empty trigger which i assume was mom and then i have half of kitten number one and then i have this shot so everybody was moving really quickly and this just caught it mid stride and that um right front limb is behind you know just everything about this is nice the the lion is open to the camera instead of closed off like this right yeah, yeah. 
So you're shooting these with a relatively wide angle lens, I'm guessing? Yeah, I'm usually not any tighter than 28. It's usually 17 millimeters if I can do it. Um, and then I crop it or um, if I'm using a fixed lens, I don't really do anything tighter than a 28. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm also guessing the shutter speed doesn't, uh, it isn't being used to stop the motion that the flash is actually stopping the motion. Yeah, exactly. Um, shutter speed, uh, set it at one two hundredth of a second just because if I'm doing a burst, the flashes will keep up with that rate. Okay. Um, but other, yeah, other than that, it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, daytime. Um, one thing. Well, video is a whole other thing. We don't have to go into video. Um, but daytime, setting your camera for daytime versus nighttime even when it's controlled with the flashes it's you're gonna have to pick one or the other you can't really expose well for full daylight and twilight and darkness you know only one of those is going to work well <laughs> so yeah, to... you as well put it all into the one that you really want all right yeah Gotta pick and choose. Yeah. So uh, is flash a problem with other wildlife? I mean, do they uh, avoid the uh, flashes or turn away from the flash or how does all that work? Yeah, what I've seen is the first time an an any animal comes through a brand new setup, they will they'll react because it's something new that never happened there before um the lions here there's a couple of things with the lions down here one is that they're used to lights from all kinds of things patio lights and um helicopters and you know cars going by on roads. And so a light flashing somewhere or coming on doesn't, it's not a novel thing. Right. So it depends where you are. If you're in a remote wilderness area, yeah, they're gonna notice. And then the other difference would be prey species react and predators don't. And that would just be a prey, a prey animal like a mule deer needs to be worried about anything and it's hard even to say is it the flash or is it the click of the shutter no because anything is going to startle them and then what i found is with the with mule deer they will startle on the first one and a lot of times they'll turn and run a few steps and then try it again and then usually it, then after that, they'll travel right through and not react. So it's mm. sort of a, a learning process that, oh, this happened, but then it didn't do anything bad to me. So this is just a thing that happens when I walk by this spot and I can ignore it and keep going. Yeah. Interesting learning behavior there. Yeah. Let's see. I think we've got one more here. This is my most recent cityscape image, and it's been a tough one. <laughs> this, this has been a tough one to get, um, and I'm still working on it. What happened here again was a female came through and she had two kittens following behind. And this was a PIR sensor, a front, a front sensor operating with a burst. 
but also the um, long exposure. So this sensor would sense motion, take a photo, and the lens would stay open for about two seconds because there's so much ambient light. Mm -hmm. It didn't need to be open for a long time. All I wanted, one, one mountain lion dead center, that's all I wanted. Mom was traveling too fast, so she was at the far left of the frame. Kitten number two um, had its ear, its ears were kind of back and it, it just didn't look calm and nice. And luckily the, this last kitten, the timing was right that by the, by the time it had done two seconds on mom, two seconds on the second, on, on the second animal, and it was ready at the right time for this one. So uh, honestly, dumb luck here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's no reason this should have worked and it did. And that's, you know, when you get a lucky, accident that is a good accident that's that's a win yeah so this is you know but this is a the story behind this is down below on the left you see a little bit of a glow in a line and that's our 405 freeway uh -huh. in the sepulveda pass so that is 12 lanes of traffic and at 3 a.m. when these animals were going, there's still a line of backed up traffic on that freeway. So this is the very eastern edge of their territory and they cannot cross that. I see. So, so you see they're, they're traveling, they don't have collars these, and they're young and they've been born into this and they're sort of learning this is the edge. You can't, you can't go any farther. And then right. of course down below is this massive sprawl of 14 million people right um, and it's, as you're traveling on your commute on the 405 coming back from the airport or something that this is this is happening just up the hill it's uh i don't i don't know how to describe why i like that so much well it's uh a different interface that's for sure huh yeah Let me stop the screen share here. How old do you think this uh, kitten is? About six months. Really? Wow. Yeah. We grow up fast. Yeah, and I haven't, um, the camera's still there. And it's been a, mm, almost a year because we've got green grass in there and it's just now starting to rain and green up again. I haven't seen them since. Uh, so. Okay. So how often do you have, speaking of time, how often do you have to change the batteries or recharge them? Um, I will visit cameras every two to three weeks. Okay. And usually something has gone wrong. <laughs> um, Batteries in flashes depends on how how many times they go off more than how long it's been. So if your sensor isn't going crazy on squirrels or wind, they can go, I would say two months. Um, and the camera batteries, I'm using because like I'm using the lithium battery packs and they're they're pretty big so camera battery I don't I don't change those very often have you tried any of those that uh have uh, cell service yes <laughs> How, how's that work out I, was able, I have about 15 of those they're fantastic here because we have cell signal everywhere. Right. Yeah. And I can only imagine they'd be really frustrating anywhere else because you, you want it to work 
and it might say like, oh, I've got one bar, but it, you know, it's yeah. not, not gonna work well. Sure. Yeah, again, those are those are great for scouting where I just wanna set a few out, see if a site is gonna work, see what kind of animal traffic is. And I don't wanna spend my half day on a weekend going out to a trail cam just to see did something happen. No, so I can set those out. I can look at them once a day at home and it's fun and just let them, let them roll until something happens or I decide nothing's ever gonna happen. Yeah, okay. So what resources would you recommend for somebody who wants to uh, learn camera trap photography? Are there any, uh, anything online or books or videos or anything? Um, about the only real resource is camtrapper.com. So C-A-M-T-R-A-P-P-E-R.com. And they have a forum. And it's it's not very many people. It's not super active. But it people will help you if you... Um, if you go onto that forum and say, hey, I'm new to this and I have a Nikon or I have a Canon and how, you know, how did you do it? And someone with the same kind of camera will jump in and say, here's, here's my setup and I used this sensor and I used the, these flashes and, um, you know, but you have to sort through and ask the right question and hope somebody finds you and wants to take the time. So um, there isn't anything real formal or substantial yet. Mm. I kind of have to find a, find a friend and, and work on it. Yeah. Well, that's too bad because it's really a, an interesting field and it, it does seem to be growing or at least maybe I'm seeing more because I'm interested, but uh, seem to be more out on social media than there used to be anyway. There is. No, it, it's definitely growing and it's, it's really exciting to see, to see just the quality come up so fast and, and to see someone who has this idea and they want to try it to um, be able to, to figure it out and set a camera out and then get rewarded with good stuff right away rather than it taking five years of total disasters. <laughs> so yeah, I've had, a, I've had a couple of people reach out to me on Facebook or email um, that are local and saying, I keep, you know, I'm following your posts and I want to do this and I know some photography and I'm, I have some good places to try and I just need a little bit of a, how, do, how does this go? And I tell them, you know, here's some photos of my setups. Here's what I do. If you have a better idea, just go for it because there are no rules. Um, and then Uh, either the steep learning curve kills that interest right away or someone pushes through and and it's just so much fun to have someone then send you some beautiful photos and say look what I got you know um, and then they're hooked for life yeah well where can people find you and uh, all the work you do I, my online presence is a silly name that got started as a joke and I am absolutely stuck with it now. So it is Cougar Magic, all one word. And Cougar Magic is on Facebook and Instagram. And I am not on Twitter. What else? Uh, CougarMagic.com is my website that is, you know, just a gallery page of images. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing all your uh, expertise and, and your journey. And it's been a lot of great info in here, I think. 
So appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing something like this. Again, like we were talking about, um, we don't have a good way to, to bring camera trappers together and figure out what we're doing. So this will absolutely help. Oh, good. Well, each episode of Photographing the West is published on the 15th and 30th of the month. If you enjoy these podcasts, please help support them by purchasing your camera gear or outdoor gear through my affiliate links in the show notes. I get a small commission and it doesn't cost you a penny more. Bye for now, and we'll see you back on January 30th with a new show on whale photography.